It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today, my guest is Bill Yo, chairman of the Yo Group and co-owner of Day and Zimmerman, Yo's parent company. Bill's prior experience includes president of Yo and chief customer officer of Dan Zimmerman, and he's the past chairman of the American Staffing Association, which represents the $150 billion U.S. staffing industry. He's also a best-selling author and keynote speaker, business and faith leader, and a family business expert. Dan Zimmerman is one of the largest family businesses in the USA, as ranked by Forbes. Bill also recently published his first book, Our Way, a biography on his father and past Yo president, Spike Yo. Bill Yo, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brant. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Great to have you here and had a chance to chat, uh, gosh, a few weeks ago. And uh, what part of the world do we catch you in today? So I am in uh, New Jersey right now. New Jersey. So we sort of split our time between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So I'm in New Jersey right now. Nice, nice. Getting into summer there, I imagine, already, right? It is, yes. Yep. <laughs> we got we got the wildfires past us. They're in other parts of the country now, so uh, right. smoke from them. And so, yes, we're moving on. Hopefully, the air is going to continue to get clearer. Well, yes. Bill, we always like to start our podcast understanding a little bit about our guests' earlier years. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what your early family life was like. Sure, Brant. Um, thanks. And, and and again, just thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and be with your listeners. And it's I really uh, I'm really grateful for what you do with with ROI and, and your business and, and trying to get the word out for people to be uh, better business leaders and better people of faith and just better contributors to to uh, the world. So thank you for what you do. Um, so I was born and raised outside Philadelphia, kind of a lifelong Pennsylvanian and lifelong Philadelphian. Um, and the youngest of five, uh, my parents had a, a very uh, long, loving 56-year marriage until my mother's passing, uh, actually eight years ago today, eight years ago mm-hmm. today, this recording, um, kind of a, a seminal moment in my life, particularly in my faith journey for a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to get a really good education, went to a, uh, a strong uh, prep school, uh, went, had a chance to go to a good college, have since earned a couple of uh, master's degrees, um, and then also grew up, as, as a little bit of the introduction said, uh, in a family business as well. So my brothers and I are now third generation owners of a pretty large family business, and um, we have been in the ownership role since uh, the late 90s. And, um, you know, that continues to be, while not sort of the, the full-time part of my uh, life that it had been, it certainly continues to be an important part of my life. So, well, tell tell me more about your parents because they were obviously the second generation. Was it your dad's side or your mom's side? So it was my dad's side. So my my grandfather on my dad's side. Uh, so my dad's father uh, was an entrepreneur. He was first in his family to go to college, and uh, he started out at University of Pennsylvania. So not exactly mm-hmm. like a safety school kind of thing, but. Um, <laughs> And then he settled in the Philadelphia area and was very entrepreneurial. And he started uh, his namesake company, the Yo Company, which we still own and operate today, which was the nation's first technical staffing company. So there had been temporary staffing before that, but Yo was the first one to do it for kind of contract engineers and designers and drafters and those kinds of things. And um, in the uh, and that was, I guess, he started that in the 40s. And then in 1960, he bought a company called Day and Zimmerman which had existed all the way back from 1901 and day and Zimmerman to this day is our, is our family business. And yo is one of the business on, underneath it. So, and we do um, industrial and technical construction and engineering and um, 
also a lot of uh, government contracting. So it's a pretty diverse business. But my dad uh, bought the business from his father in the 70s. So I would say we had growing up a uh, it was, it, I don't want to say it was as stark as dad ran the business and mom ran the family, but dad certainly spent the majority of his time in the business and, and mom the majority of time in the family. But one of the things I really appreciate it looking back, while that was uh, the case and largely sort of you know appropriate for the, the generation, uh, my dad was certainly involved with the family when he was home. Um, you know, he could cook, which a lot of dads couldn't. Um, you know, he would he would sort of make a point to give mom a break on the weekends. Um, you know, I was the youngest of five, so he had a little more flexibility in his schedule and was able to attend a number of my sporting events in high school. Um, and then on the other side, you know, my mom was always very active in different uh, community and charitable organizations. And then together, the two of them you know, were a great team in terms of being involved in community events or or, or uh, you know, events with our business um, or different kind of things like that. You know, they really they each did their own thing, but they teamed really well and supported each other. And that was kind of a nice template for, for, you know, how to make a marriage work. That's nice. Were, were all of you as siblings involved in the business in the uh, early days of your life? We were actually. And, and uh, so, you know, some of this work, uh, you know, summers through school, mostly or exclusively through the business. And some like me, I was kind of 50, 50, about half my working summers were doing other things and half were working in the business. But uh, amazingly, uh, all five of us joined the business at some point in our 20s, uh, a few of us right after college and a few later than that. Um, and so when when my father retired in the late 90s, actually, all five of us were working at the company and all five of us participated in the, the buyout and the transition of him. So uh, yeah. I only have three children and I can't imagine coordinate all three to be in the same field of work, <laughs> let alone in the same business or same company. So are all five of you still involved in business today? We're not, no. So two of my siblings uh, elected to uh, exit the business, one in the early 2000s, one of my brothers, and then my sister more in the kind of mid to late 2000s. And we had a, a requirement at the time, and it's something that's not uncommon in family businesses, that if you want to own stock in the company, you have to work in the business. And there's a whole bunch of reasons that's probably a little off topic for today about why we did that. And, and we changed that, but still retain kind of the intent behind it. But for different reasons, my one brother and, and my sister each decided they wanted to go and do something else. Um, and so we had, you know, amicable arm's length kind of transaction. Everyone remained siblings afterwards. Um, but, you know, since the late 2000s, two of my brothers uh, and I have been the ones to continue to own and operate the business. And I was involved in a full time operating position up until about seven or eight years ago, maybe seven years ago when I transitioned out. And so now I'm in a more uh, limited uh a uh, more limited um, role with the business, more as being chairman of one of our businesses and more involved in the ownership and the family business governance side of things. So, Got it. But my other two brothers remain fully dedicated to it. Now, you mentioned that uh, we're both men of faith. Um, when did you come to Christ, Bill, and, and what role did he play in your upbringing? Sure. Um, and it's kind of interesting because I, I, I have been a person of faith my whole life, but mm. I wouldn't necessarily say that I came to Christ as, as a young person, it, it was just, it was not really part of my vocabulary. Um, and I've kind of found I've, I've studied faith and Christianity specifically in a lot of denominations uh, more recently in my life. And, you know, a lot of what would be called sort of those mainline or mainstream Protestant denominations, you know, didn't, I wouldn't say particularly compared to maybe some more non-denominational uh, areas of the faith, it wasn't really all about Jesus Christ or it wasn't, you know, Christ being foregrounded and, and Christ being Lord and Savior. There was a lot more about God, the Father, a lot more about, uh, you know, the Holy Trinity, um, the, the term that, that scared the heck out of me as a kid, the Holy Ghost. I'm really happy. <laughs> me a lot too. of faith traditions have retired that now and it's now the Holy Spirit. But right. so I, I was, you know, I was baptized and confirmed in the Episcopalian Church and uh, we 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 worshiped and we went to church most uh, most Sundays and uh, for some reason, like a lot of the mainline Protestant traditions, we got the summers off, so we didn't go to church a lot during the summer. But um, and then m much later in my life, just a few years ago, I actually converted to Roman Catholicism. But uh, so you know, faith was I would say a part of our lives, but it was probably one of several different I'd say sort of descriptors of our lives. Um, you know, it would not maybe be sort of the, the compelling driver of our lives the way, say, I would consider my faith the driver of my life today. And a lot of that really pivoted, as I mentioned, eight years ago to today when my when my mom passed. So 
Got it. Who, who or what were some of the early inspirations uh, in your childhood, Bill? Sure. Well, you know, I say that the first one that comes to mind would be my dad. Um, I actually, the first book that I published was it was an audit was a biography on him. Uh, by extension, it was on our business and on our family. But you know, I figure if I decided in my in my forties to to take a whole bunch of time and research and write a book on my father, he must have had some kind of an influence on me. So, um, but yeah, he he certainly was. Um, and then I would also say, you know, I was a, I was pretty involved in sports in high school. I had a definitely certainly a number of coaches and, and a number of teachers you know, that I can look back on that uh, can definitely say had a real impact and, and sort of showed me what, you know, what mentoring could look like, as opposed to, say, a, a professional athlete who I might look up to and admire, but I wouldn't consider there to have been any kind of mentoring role there like there would be with people who I had, you know, relationship with. Yeah. Was it a foregone conclusion that you'd go on to university? Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it, well, it was at least it was never not doing so was not something I ever considered. And, right. and in my family, not only did I go on to university, but I followed in the footsteps of both of my parents and all, all four of my siblings and went to Duke University in North wow. Carolina, where it's where my parents met. And, and kind of amazingly, all five of us went there, plus a few other cousins and nieces and nephews and one of my own children. And so we, we, we have had quite a quite a history at Duke. Um, Wonderful. So, but, but, you know, I be, being the youngest in the family, Liked, liked to think of myself as a bit of a rebel back then. And so I was going to go somewhere else, largely just for the purpose of going somewhere else. But then when <laughs> senior year rolled around and I got really serious about looking at places, I kind of thought, oh, my goodness, if I have a chance to go here, you know, I'd be crazy not to. And I'm certainly happy I did. So, And then went on to master's studies at the Wharton School. Mm -hmm. Did you do that yes. straight out of Duke or was there some work time? No, there, were, there was a gap. I, uh, I, you know, I graduated Duke. I guess 22 years old and, and uh, got my MBA, you know, kind of 28 to 30 or 29 to 31. And, and I did an executive MBA program. So that's where you work still full time. But basically every other Friday you go to you go to school for two or three days. So it's still a, a two year program, but it's much more uh, concentrated in terms of the, the class time. And so that, that those were busy years because we also started our family during that time as well. So, yeah. Now, did you go right into the family business or did you have some other jobs when you got out of Duke? I, um, I, uh, well, basically I didn't, I, I did work at the company a little bit right after school, but it was mainly because I was, uh, rehabbing after my third and fourth knee surgeries, oh, um, from some athletic, like athletic injuries I had had. So I kind of just did some part-time work, but my first full-time job was outside of the company and I worked in the management consulting industry and it was an industry that always fascinated me. I always knew I wanted to be in business. And what I like about management consulting is you got exposure to a lot of different industries. You had a chance to travel. Um, so I actually joined with a management consulting firm out on the West Coast for a couple of years before then, I guess, around my mid 20s, 25, 26 ish, I joined the company for good, our, our family business full time. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And in what capacity did you first join the company? Um, I came in in kind of a, it was a nice transition actually from the consulting world. I came in in a business analyst role, uh, working for, uh, you know, a, a senior person who looked at all of our, did all of our strategic planning, did our mergers and acquisitions, would look at different entrepreneurial startups. So kind of the, anything that was sort of outside of the, the normal operations of the business or anything that had to do with the normal budgeting and strategic planning cycles of the businesses. So it was a chance to you know, use some of the things I had learned externally, which was nice. So I could come in with a little bit of a, of a walking start, if you will. And then most of my career, my career, I guess, was kind of a combination of both sort of staff jobs like that would be, and, you know, operating or business jobs, you know, being out in, in one of the businesses doing different things. So. Tell us the first time when you started managing people. Yeah. So that would have been, um, you know, probably a, few years or maybe even a little less than that after I came back. Sadly, my the person who I worked for right when I came back to the company, who, who I consider one of my mentors, um, got sick and, and died after a uh, relatively short battle with, with mm. cancer. Um, but I ended up assuming a number of his duties. And what was interesting is that the, um, I want to say if, if probably three or four people started reporting to me, all but one of them were, were older than I was and, and yeah. you know, even a bit at the company longer than I was. And that was a really interesting experience. And then while not in my first management position, I can remember in one of my early management positions, um, you know, one of the employees that I had inherited who had been with the company a long time was, 
was sort of uh, largely uh, recognized as somebody whose probably best years with our company were behind him. And you know, <laughs> he was still a, he was still a, a great person, and a good professional, but just no longer a good fit for us. So uh, I remember when I when I had to, to go through the task of letting him go, it occurred to me that he had he had been in the industry longer than I'd been alive. <laughs> Right. And so that was a very humbling and I'll say sort of guilt ridden experience for me, you know, to have to do that. But yeah, you know, I've always had this this calling to recognize that, you know, the what what's good for the, the you know, the the needs of the whole group, you know, really should should weigh heavily as opposed to the needs of sort of any one individual within the group. Well, it's been hard coming in as well as part of the third generation with, you know, the history behind that. And, you know, coming in with employees that have obviously been mm -hmm. there as long as you've been around. You know, it, it really was brilliant. And, yeah. and one of the things, well, actually, when I was in business school, and it's kind of amazing to look back, you know, 20 whatever years ago, Wharton would have you write papers. But I got to write a paper in one of my classes, and I remember titling it uh, Bill So-and-So versus So-and-So Yo. And what I talked about was the experience when I worked outside of the company in management consulting or, or some of my other summer jobs. It was you know, Bill so-and-so, that tall kid from Philadelphia or whatever. But, you know, when you're at the company, it's, well, so-and-so, yo, it's the youngest of the next generation <laughs> and just how those differences are. And so we, we have really learned a lot about that. And with, you know, the, the members of our next generation that work in the business, we, you know, we make sure we talk with them so that they're thoughtful about, just like you said, you know, people may treat you differently. They may talk to you differently. They may notice if your car gets into the office sooner than other people's and, and those kind of things. So these are all, you know, they're, they're, you could say they're responsibilities, but they come with the opportunities of ownership as well. So I know from your uh, bio, and we've talked a little bit about your expertise in family business when we last spoke, right? What, what would you say is kind of one of those key things that you need to do as a family member coming into, you know, an organization like that, that's steeped in culture, but, uh, you know, the, the thing that's maybe right. you're known best right. for is your last right. name, not necessarily yeah. your expertise or qualifications. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And certainly, um, you know, for me, the, the main thing that I knew I could do is I could work hard. And that that's something that, you know, really since early childhood up to today and, and probably for the rest of my years, I've always just been a very hard worker. And I knew if if nothing else, at least if I was working hard, people would see that that effort was being put in. Um, but something else we try to be intentional about, I'd say we're getting better about it as time moves on it is, you know, they're like any sort of field. There are some wonky terms in the family business industry or family businesses. And one of them is the term meritocracy. Hmm. So, so merit based, uh, basically meritocracy, which is the whole idea is that people get, get into jobs because they have merited or earned those jobs, not through nepotism or just sort of thrown into them. And so. We've really tried to, to to work off that, and I'll say, you know, a, a few of my early positions probably weren't totally meritocracy based, but that, you know, I could say that they were developmental based, where my father knew or the decision makers that they, I'd be surrounded with good talent who would help me grow, and I could, you know, eventually help them, and I'm grateful for those things. But but knowing you go into a role where you have some ability to contribute, like I mentioned, when I first came back from the West Coast. I went into an analyst role and it, and it really married a lot of the things I'd done with my consulting world. And with one of my nephews, we realized several years later that in, a, in about his first maybe seven years with the company, he had, he had had five different roles, but none of them really built on the others. And, mm. and all of a sudden we realized that, you know, we really want to be intentional about how we career pass owners so that they're set up for success so that they can contribute their their gifts and their skills and, and the things that they're learning and yeah but with all that said to your original question yes it's certainly um it's it's not for everybody to come in and kind of have that that bright spotlight on you and i'm sure um some of those first jobs you were reporting to non-family members right folks that have been oh, stuck yes. in the organization yep. for some time well, most definitely and, and even that is something that that you know you want to be very thoughtful about as to whom do family members report. And, right. um, and I was fortunate enough that I, re I reported to some really remarkable professionals who you know, kind of weren't, didn't shy away from those kind of things, but, um, <laughs> you know, and they, they welcomed the role and, uh, and I learned a lot from, from all of them. I've heard it said that, you know, um, the expectation of others is that you get treated with deference, but usually the opposite is true. 
you know, mm-hmm. they, they treat mm-hmm. you with maybe a little bit of a harder, uh, you know, task ahead and, and, you know, challenged by the uh, opportunity of the name, you know, right. uh, well, you, you, you've got to work extra hard in right, order right. to really prove yourself. Did you experience well, and, some and, of that? And probably, exactly. And probably encouraged by the, the uh, sort of incumbent generation of ownership too. You know? So my, my father <laughs> Indeed. as well as say, Indeed. you're getting Bill and work his butt off. <laughs> he's got to prove himself yeah, and, so. and again you were the youngest of five were, were all the siblings at that time also involved in the business when you first joined they they were yes all, mm-hmm. all of us were and um and and it, as i mentioned at the top you know, we're a very diversified company and so we were all in different parts of the organization there was one time for a very brief overlap where one of my brothers and i were in the same business but we weren't in any kind of a reporting relationship. Um, so we're all in different parts. And then, and that, that all maintained itself for a long time until, you know, many of us sort of climbed the corporate ladder, if you will, and ended up in yeah. the, you know, Aged sort of a leadership out. team position. And then, yeah, <laughs> Aged right? out of and those then, junior roles. <laughs> well, and that's, we kind of like to, to, to joke when we first bought the business, we put an advisory board role in place. And the whole idea was to, you know, bring in the proverbial gray hair to help us young, young whippersnappers. And now right. sadly, most of us have more gray hair than any of our advisors do. So. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how, you know, faith uh, supported you through some difficult periods during that uh, early career. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I, as I said earlier, in, in my earlier career, I, I, didn't, I didn't actively access my faith. I mean, it was sort of part of what I did, but it, it was... Um, not really something I would readily rely on. Um, I was always conscious and aware of the power of people and the power of community and you know, the power of sort of a, what I could now label as a, um, an inclination towards the common good. But I didn't have an understanding or a filter or an awareness that those were divinely inspired uh, forces at work, which, which, okay. I, which I now you know, deeply believe them to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, through a lot of my life, you know, I was not as, as inclined to be faith fueled on a regular basis as I am now. So we uh, talked about in your bio that, you know, not only are you chairman of the yo group and have had several management positions and the senior leadership of Dan Zimmerman, but you're also an author and and a speaker. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the books you've written and, you know, the inspiration for those. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, and it all kind of, uh, it pivoted when, you know, as I mentioned, my mom passed away eight years ago and it was a very, uh, sad experience losing my mother, sort of that inevitable parent passing away situation, but it was also a very beautiful experience. And it was beautiful in that, you know, she was surrounded by loved ones. There was a beautiful sunset streaming in the window or in the large door, you know, glass door. And I was holding her hand as she took her last breath. And, and we knew the moment that her pain and suffering ended. But for me in particular, what made it so beautiful is in that moment, God was present and God was Mm -hmm. present for me in the room like God had never been present before and really Uh physically pushed on my chest, not just pulled on my heart, but pushed on my chest. And and within a couple of months after that experience, and I didn't have the access to really label it as what it was, but it it really changed my life. And so a couple months later, I made the decision and talking with my wife and my brothers that I was going to pull out a lot of my management responsibilities and go ahead and research and write a book on our father. And, you know, he was still in good health and, you know, he's recently widowed. And so I had the chance to spend a lot of time with him doing a lot of interviews, did uh, 20 some recorded interviews with him and interviewed 75 other people. So I had these 95 recorded transcribed interviews from every facet of his life we could get our hands on and Fantastic. Uh, really just enjoyed doing the research and stitching together the story and, and you know, clearly the story of somebody that, that you know, means so much to me and, um, and, and that was a really powerful opportunity for me. The, the book won an award for its writing, which was, which was great. And, uh, and I had the chance to talk a lot about different aspects of the book, whether it's about family business or um, dealing with dynamics of personal versus professional life or uh, raising children with wealth um, you know, or community give back and, and different kinds of things along those lines. But as time progressed after my mom passed, I also got more and more committed to my faith journey and I started getting involved in small groups and and reflections and fellowship groups and um, then started going on mission work. One of my brothers, Jeff, and his wife, Suzanne, uh, started a a food ministry, a Christian food ministry, and a lot of their food has been sent down to Nicaragua. 
So eventually, after a few years, my brother asking went down there with him. While I was down there, I had a again a, a revelation, and I can now say, you know, from the Holy Spirit to to write a book on that trip. And so it took several years to get that pulled together. But just earlier this year, I published my second book, uh, which is called Unvarnished Faith, and it's a book about this mission trip, my first mission trip, overseas mission trip I went on, and the life op- observations that came out of that. Yeah. And um, and that became a number one bestseller on on Amazon, which has been great. And now I'm spending more time talking about that and, and really connecting, if you will, the, the content of the first book, which is about family and business and balancing those things with the second book, which is, you know, how do you live a faith-fueled life and, and how those things kind of work together. And I've had the chance to write some different other blogs and articles and poetry and different sorts of things. And then uh, my wife and I also own a, own a small business, a small seasonal business as well. So, Fantastic. Well, it's kind of interesting. You obviously were very, very close to your mother, but you wrote a book about your dad. Mm-hmm. How did that come about? Yeah, well, I mean, un- unfortunately, I didn't, didn't feel the calling to write a book about my mom until she <laughs> passed. But, right. but uh, what, one of the most meaningful parts of the book for me was certainly the role my mom played in the book. And what was interesting is even though I was writing nonfiction, there was still the whole idea about who are the characters in the plot and what's the character development look like and what are the key scenes. And just like a a screenwriter would do for a movie, you know, how do I develop these various characters? And so, and my brothers were very helpful with, you know, how do we develop my mom? How do we develop each of us? How do we develop my sister? Uh, My sister had actually predeceased my mom. Um, So, so how do we, put all these things in place. And even to the point, it was amazing studying my mom's lineage and, and sort of her, her uh, you know, where she came from, that, uh, that her grandparents' names were actually Mary and Joseph. <laughs> and um, when, when Mary got pregnant, they actually left where they were and went somewhere else to have a baby. So um, oh, yeah. it was kind of a, a cool little a cool little thing we recognize, but, um, and, and, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, the influence my mom had on my life was, was, uh, tremendous. So awesome. while the book wasn't about her, she certainly was featured very prominently. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, uh, Day and Zimmerman. Now that was a business that was purchased. It's obviously become a family business and you had a variety of different leadership responsibilities there. Tell us about Day and Zimmerman as a company. What, what do you folks do? Sure. No, I'm, I'm really proud to. And actually, the, the, the way that I that I love to talk about the company is we put people to work, we protect freedom and we power and improve the world. Wow. Um, so <laughs> yeah. that's a mouthful. So, but, but we have we have forty five thousand employees. We, we've been around for one hundred and twenty two years now. Um, and we really are proud of the various things that we do. So we're, we're a, a large construction and engineering company. We're a large technical staffing company, as I talked about, and we also have uh, federal and defense and government contracting businesses. So uh, while it's a diverse business, everything we do has to deal with technical projects, technical work, um, hazardous work. A lot of the work we do is high hazard work. We do work with uh, in nuclear power plants. We do work in um, uh, in government facilities and ammunition plants. Uh, we do work overseas in, in Department of State facilities. So, but we pride ourselves on doing hazardous work safely. And so keeping people safe, not just physically, but also emotionally um, and professionally are, are very things that really matter to us. And that actually marries very well with my faith commitment to, to everybody's right to inherent dignity. Keeping somebody safe is a way to honor their dignity. So yeah. Um, and we have a really strong culture at our company. It's something we're really proud of that, you know, we, we, we often hear that it's a, it's, there's a familiness to our culture and not just the Yo family, but that it's a, it's a company that like a family is very close, very committed to each other, doesn't always get along with each other. And we're okay mm-hmm. with that. We like a little edginess in our culture. Um, but you know, it's people that enjoy spending time together and, and, you know, when people enjoy being at work, they're going to give you their discretionary effort and feel more engaged. And, you know, there's miles and miles of research that says when you have engaged employees, your company is going to perform well. So you probably have seen a lot of people you know, come and go over the years, maybe a lot more that have stayed than have left. But what do you think really differentiates those that have stayed with Day and Zimmerman over the years? Yeah, Roy Brent, that's such a good question. And I really it, it comes back to something I've said before. It comes back to an alignment in core values. Um, you know, the, the things that we as a company stand for around safety and integrity and 
the diversity of our workforce, the success of our employees and our customers. You know, these are things that people care about. And in particular, you know, the integrity value. And we have a, our, our tagline, our corporate uh, motto is we do what we say. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, we've, we've been committed to that for a long time. If we say we're going to do something, whether that's in a commitment to a client or whether that's a commitment to a colleague that we'll call them back this afternoon, knowing that we are going to be, that we're going to hold ourselves accountable to our words and not just let talk be cheap is something that, you know, it, you don't always see that in the business world. And, and, you know, we don't cut corners. Uh, and as a private company, we don't have to make sacrifices on the medium and long term for short term, you know, market reports and, and stock prices. So we really, I think more than anything is that, that people that like to work hard, be, in, be in, a, in an environment that is filled with integrity, an environment that's committed to excellence and, and, and people who are, you know, want to have fun along the way. And it's been really neat to see how many people, you know, have stayed at our company for decades. And, you know, and even I can think of some of the generations of people who, uh, you know, were, were sort of the key stalwarts when I was coming up, you know, sadly, many of them are passing away now, but, mm. uh, or, or their spouses are, but, you know, inevitably there's going to be a great, you know, day in Zimmerman reunion at some of those, uh, you know, funeral services. And, and it's, it's always kind of and a, beyond. a thin, and beyond. But, but gratifying. <laughs> yes, exactly. A nice yeah. uh, silver lining. Yes. Is, is there an intent to pass along the organization to, and an interest to pass along the organization to the fourth and fifth generation? Yeah, yeah no, it's another another great question. And so uh, my, my the two brothers and I, the three of us that own the business, have 11 children um, and now I guess four, four grandchildren within, the, you know, within those things. And we certainly are running the business in a way that it, it can be handed along. Um, right now, there are two of the next generation working in the business, one full-time and one part-time. Um, and then we've got another handful of folks who are also out of college and in their careers and they're, and some of those careers marry well with some of the things that Dave and Zimmerman does. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't, you know, we had five out of five in our generation join and, um, you know, we don't expect anything near 11 out of 11 of the next generation <laughs> to join. But we also recognize that the company will likely change because my my, my brother Hal, who's our, our CEO, um, you know, he's been CEO now for 23 years, maybe maybe 24. Uh, that when when he is ready to transition from that position, in all likelihood, his his replacement will not be a family member. And so at that point, we will move our advisory board to more of a fiduciary board. Right. And our family will no longer be kind of the owner operator generation, but will be more a, you know the company will become a board led. Uh, family business. And, you know, at that point, um, in some ways, it opens up more opportunities for the next generation because, sure. you know, people can be very responsible board members and fiduciaries that maybe, you know, don't, you know, haven't put in a lot of the time in the business. Now, with that said, we still would need people to be knowledgeable of the business. So we use this term a lot called stickiness. Right. You know, how do we keep the company sticky to the family and the family sticky to the company? But we also realized that, you know, the next generation is not us and our generation, you know, three of the five of us have been really committed to it. Two of us weren't. And, you know, in some ways it's going to be up to the next generation when they're kind of in the, the controlling seat, which is you know not necessarily anytime too soon in terms of, you know, will they continue to operate the company? Will maybe some of them stay involved and some won't. Um, but, you know, we know we're just committed to continuing to have it be a family business and a, and a business. We, we talk a lot about, about a business that we're proud to put our name on. Hmm. And it's that whole okay. proverbial, if there's an article written in the paper, you want it to be something you know that you can be proud of. And that's, that's kind of what drives us every day. Bill, you've done a lot of hiring over the years and of course been involved in some as well in terms of, you know, direct hiring and influence on others. What, what do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in and hire the O group and the Zimmer? Yeah, um, boy, there's and, and there's nothing more important. I mean, m most of our businesses are service businesses, so they're they're you know very people intensive, and even our manufacturing businesses require really quality talent. So um, it really starts with knowing what competencies we need within the business, whether it's an executive role, a technical role, a sales role, a back office role. You know, what does it really take to be successful in that role? And then you know, how do you target and screen people based on their past experience being successful with those competencies or in those kinds of areas. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have to have done the exact job, but if you know what the competencies are required, 
you know, you can do that. So that's kind of on an individual basis. But then, you know, when we look more broadly, clearly we look for people who like to work with others, people who don't mind, you know, uh, digging into, uh, you know, some tough conversations, people who have demonstrated a strong work ethic. Um, you know, so it really kind of varies based on what the job is. But, you know, I can tell from personal experience, you know, when I built teams that have not been successful, the, the, the number one thing that I've done wrong is I hired a whole bunch of people who were like me. Hmm. And that that does not work. That that I can guarantee by personal experience. If, if you hire a whole bunch of people that are like the leader, uh, that team is going to be too homogeneous to, uh, to have a lot They'll of They'll have the same blind spots. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite interview question that you've used over the years, Bill, with some success? Um, you know, that's a good question. Well, you know, this, this doesn't apply to today at Zimmerman, but I, but I mentioned, um, my wife and I own a, a small seasonal business. So it's actually a miniature golf course, um, cool. in a, in a short community. And I actually built a competency model for our miniature golf course for the high school and college kids that we interview. Um, and people are like, wait, you built a competency model for that, but I did, but you know, one of the things that that it's important for us to be able to do is, you know, when employees do things wrong, we'd like to be able to point out to them and we do it in kind ways, um, you know, that, Hey, this didn't happen. How would you like to do it that way? So one of the questions we ask people is, can, you know, can you give me an example of a time where you've gotten negative feedback from an adult who's not your parent? Mm. So a teacher, a coach, a, a boss, whatever. And, and what we found is interesting, particularly with people early in high school, they really haven't gotten a lot of negative feedback in their lives. Hmm. Now, when, when you get an athlete who might be in 11th or 12th grade or somebody who's in college, you know, they, they've had some adults tell them that they're not perfect. And um, it's just it's nice to have somebody who has that experience to know that, yes, I've been my, my, my work has been critiqued. My performance has been critiqued. And I've learned that it doesn't make me a bad person. It just means that I can do a better job in certain areas. So got stuff to work on. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and by the way, that 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 same methodology applies to, you know, people who are in more advanced stages of their career, of course, are people comfortable receiving feedback that they're not perfect. Absolutely. And not everybody is. Bill, you've been very generous with your time, but we always have one last question we ask our guests. And that's kind of what kind of career and life advice you would give someone who maybe has their eyes in leadership business, particularly in a family business, and uh, maybe doesn't have, you know, the idea in terms of how to get there. What, what would you tell them? Um, boy, that's a big question. That is a, that is a big one to end on. Um, <clears throat> so somebody, you know, career advice for somebody who has that interest in kind of a, a ascending the ladder and getting more senior, you know, what I would say it, it's a, there's a combination of, on the one hand, learning your business or your craft really well, you know, gaining that credibility in the marketplace, that credibility, you know, with customers, that credibility of accomplishing projects and, and, you know, that, the whole thing that, you know what, like she can get the job done and she has a track record of getting the job done. But then that combines with as as physicians get more and more senior, the technical aspects of your role become relatively less prominent and the strategic and people aspects of your role become more relevant. And so, you know, to have that that bedrock and that sort of table stake, if you will, as an executive to say, yes, she, she or she has a track record in the industry and, and they know what they're talking about when they're running this business. But, you know, the, the irony is for as, as important as that is as credibility, that that in terms of your day to day, week to week, month to month activities becomes less and less of what you do because you're now dealing with strategy, you're dealing with vision, you're dealing with building organizations and managing teams and interacting with other executives. And um, so sort of being cognizant of that that shift in in uh, how those sort of two big buckets of tasks and duties and, and energies uh, evolve, I think is really important. Yeah, great stuff. Well, Bill Yo, chairman of the Yo Group, thank you so much for sharing your career journey. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.